Now, to introduce our keynote speaker for this evening, Peter Van Manen. Dr. Peter Van Manen, indeed, is Managing Director of McLaren Electronic Systems, the UK-based company that provides the control and data systems to all of the competitors in the Formula One World Championships. For those of you um, not from the UK, especially our American delegates, you may be more familiar with the IZOD IndyCar series and the, um, from 2012, the NASCAR Sprint Cup series, which all have McLaren data systems in them. What many of you may not know, and certainly I wasn't aware of, is that McLaren also manufactures systems for healthcare, um, with them all having their origins in Formula One, a sport and business that is characterized by rapid development underpinned by effective exploitation of simulation and real-time data systems. So the link with healthcare, finally, we know why we've got this fantastic car on stage with us. Peter is a mechanical engineer by training and has been the McLaren, with McLaren for 20 years, uh, has been running the company firstly as operations and then as the managing director since 1997. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to introduce Peter Van Manen. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I have to say I've had a wonderful day today. We got started with a sing-song by the beach and got to meet a whole lot of new friends who I could sing with. At the lunchtime event, we learnt a lot of new and interesting ways in which we could stack all those pesky cats we find around the neighbourhood. And... This evening, I get the chance to talk to, to all of you a little bit about motor racing. So, I'd like to start off with a short film. Looking after ill people and trying to make them better again is probably one of the most challenging and difficult areas of human endeavour. Every day, doctors, nurses, every day of their working life, every evening, they've got to spend time knowing that if they don't diagnose a condition correctly, if they somehow give the wrong intervention, if they just miss seeing that a condition is changing, it can be the difference in how a patient in front of them is going to live the rest of their life, or even worse, uh, have deadly consequences. It's hard. Now, motor racing is also hard. It's not life and death, or at least it should never be so, but it's difficult. And the results of doing things wrong are just as terminal. In Formula One, in the last 40 years, there have been 100 teams that have come and gone. They've either run out of talent, they've run out of energy, they've run out of money. They haven't been able to achieve what you need to do to be successful in Formula One. They haven't been able to win races, and so they've fallen by the wayside. Now, as Fiona said to you, I'm an engineer. I've been in Formula One for 20 years. When I first started uh, in Formula One, it was a, a tough sport. There were fewer people, the competition was less aggressive, there weren't as many people watching, but it was still tough. Now, there are three things that haven't changed in Formula One 
over those 20 years. Motorsport is dangerous. Every, every time that you go to a race, if you look at the ticket that you're given at the bottom, it says, motorsport is dangerous. The other truth is that to finish first, first you have to finish. And the third thing is that people only ever remember the winners. Damon Hill, a British world champion, once said, only my wife and my dog remember when I come second. There's a little message in that. If, you, if you're ever negotiating with a racing car driver for a contract and you say, what do you want? And he answers, I want a dog. <laughs> he's probably not the man for you. <laughs> so Formula One, it's about entertainment. About 8% of the world's population will watch at least one race every year. 3% of the world's population watch every race live. That's a huge number of eyeballs watching what you're doing. Formula One is excellent. There are 24 Formula One drivers in the world. It is the most elite form of sportsman that you will ever find. And Formula One is also about innovation. So, I'm going to get this over and done with. This is the little bit of physics lesson. Um, I've, I've brought a car with me. And I'm going to give you a very short uh, introduction how to make a car go fast. Well, the first thing is, the car is very light. A Formula One car is about 650 kilograms with the driver. It also has a very powerful engine. The V8 engine generates about 750 horsepower. It has very sticky tyres to give it grip and very good aerodynamics to push it down into the ground. The front of the car, you can see a wing there, the air is coming towards it, it's being rushed underneath the car, under the floor, and the car acts like an upside down wing. It, it sucks the car down onto the ground. You also bring air into the engine. You need air to be able to add fuel to generate torque. For those of you who are not familiar with how cars work, you can think of it in medical terms. We have a system that depends on very efficient respiration, very efficient circulation, get the fuel where you want it, and uh, the dietary has to be good, the nutrition, and a lot of good exercise. The Formula One car, they, they talk a lot about down, downforce. This is because you need to push those tyres into the ground to generate grip, to generate cornering. A Formula One car will travel at speeds up to 360 kilometres an hour. It is the most aggressive car, uh, vehicle in the world in terms of braking. These cars brake at about 5G, that's five times the acceleration due to gravity. And they throw the driver around every time they go around a corner. There's 4G side to side forces. So it's a very violent beast. Now, the Formula One car is 95% brand new every year. Around about this time, April, May, uh, the new car is conceived and we spend the next nine months designing, developing and building it so that our car will come out sometime in January. It will go testing in February, usually in Spain. There will be three tests and then we let it loose on the racing track. The Formula One car is made up of about 12,000 components in the chassis. There are about 6,000 components in the engine and about 8,000, 9,000 in the electronics. So think about that. Next time you're watching a, a, a race, at the start of the race as the cars line up, that's as many components as there are in all the bones, in all the bodies in this auditorium and they were designed in a very short length of time and going to be driven at speed around a track. But it doesn't finish there because 
Formula One is very aggressive. Teams are there to win. They're, te- they're there to be better than the rest. And so throughout the year, between races, you are developing the car to make it even faster, to make it suit the next track that you're going onto. Between races, there, there will be anything between three and eight large engineering changes made to that car to make it faster. How much faster are we talking about? In a 100 second lap, if you can make the car one or two tenths of a second faster, that can be the difference between being at the front of the pack and being somewhere in the middle or even behind. During the year, there, in a top team, a new component is designed every 20 minutes. They are building, the top teams are building somewhere between three and 5,000 new components every week. The message there in Formula One is to be successful, you can't stop still. You always need to develop things to go even quicker. Okay, I'm going to tell you a little secret about innovation. There's a little bit of innovation which is about inventing new things and having great ideas. Uh, there's a large part of watching what other people do and saying, yeah, I'll have that, I can do better. I heard someone in a speech talk about it as borrowing with pride, so let's, let's stick with that. Anyway, so I, I decided that I was going to take this symbol and use it for Formula One. So some of you may recognise it. Uh, it's, a, it's a snake curling round a rod. Now to me... The rod represents innovation, technology. It's always moving upwards. The snake is embracing it. It's giving it attention. It's it's moving itself up the rod to make things better. So the rod and the snake is innovation and execution. Good ideas and putting them into action. The way that you win races is recognising new technology, recognising new ideas, and then doing something about it. A good idea with no execution is just a good idea. And so one of the, one of the messages from Formula One is if you want to make a difference, it's not enough to think about what is the right thing to do. You also have to, at some point, try and do it. Now, 25 years ago, Formula One was a bit different. We had fairly simple cars by comparison, big fat sticky tyres, large engines and not as much change during the season. It was less aggressive than it is now. But 25 years ago when the race engineers started talking to their drivers they realised that if they had a little bit of data as well that it would provide a means by which they could start talking about what they understood. Race engineers and racing car drivers don't always speak the same language and so providing a a common uh, element which they can talk around was quite useful. 25 years ago it was fairly simple. You had a handful of sensors on the car, you had a data logger, so logging that data, and a fairly simple telemetry system. Generally speaking, as the car went past the garage it would burst some data across and then when the driver was coming back to the pit, they would quickly print out a, a, a graph to show him and then look at, the, look at the data and decide when a car was travelling fast around a corner, when it was a bit slower, etc. So the cat was out of a bag. If we start measuring things and we start looking at what we measure and we start doing something about it, we can make our car go faster. Now today, the car's a lot more complicated, but the car we've got on the stage here, underneath uh, all the bodywork, when it goes out on the racetrack, there are about 125 different sensors measuring different things about the car. We are logging around about 500 different parameters whenever the car goes out. We have around 13,000 health parameters being sent back to the garage. And we're not creating all this data just because we like storing data. We don't. We're looking at these, the data so that we can develop a story about how we can make the car go faster. We can see when the condition of the car starts to deteriorate. 
we can start taking action earlier. So the importance of being able to immediately determine when something needs action is important. If you go to the back of a, of a garage in a Formula One uh, team, you'll see guys, race engineers, looking at data screens. There's a huge amount of data coming out. Uh, they have different patterns that they're looking for. They're looking at the timing of their opposition to see how, the other, how fast the other cars are. But also, they're, they're reacting to things that the car is telling it. The data is speaking to them and saying, you need to do something. Something's not quite right. You can make it faster. And so, over the years, the, the level at which people start to look at data increases. Every time you learn something which is systematic, which is general, you embed it into the system, and so others within the team can benefit. You try to free your intellect so it is available to deal with the surprises that come up, not deal with things that have happened before and someone's already worked out what you could do with it. Before a race and, and during a race, not only are there people looking at the data within the garages, but at the same time, that information is being sent remotely back to the factories so that engineers, uh, strategists, can be looking at that data away from the racetrack and determining how best to make their cars the fastest and also to understand what the competitor is doing. We have a lot of simulations which are taking place all the time before a race weekend to try to work out what can we do to make this car faster. When the cars arrive on a, on a Friday and they go out on the track, you're also grabbing timing information from your competitors and using that to try to determine how fast they are. How does the speed of your competitors start to go down when the tyres get worn? What happens when the fuel is less and they, they're, they're running lighter? All of this information you can use to understand how best to run that race. So we're taking a huge amount of data from our own cars to be able to distill what's important about making it quicker. And we're taking quite limited information from our competitor, split time information, and enriching that as far as we can in terms of how do you process that, how do you display that, so that you can have the best idea of what your competitor is going to do. Like all plans, the moment that you actually start racing, everything changes. But that doesn't stop you from looking at things beforehand so that you're the best prepared. It also doesn't stop you from continually looking at that information. So, I mentioned to you the fact that our cars are developing throughout the year. Another thing which has changed in the last five years is that we are no longer allowed to have any testing during the season. What that means is that it puts more pressure on the people inventing things to make them work. So the first time that a, an evolution of the car is put into play will be during a first Friday session at a racetrack. You have to have a lot of confidence in yourself and a lot of processes behind you to make sure that you're putting something brand new that has never run on a car onto a racing car that the moment that driver takes it out he will try to go as fast as he possibly can. This is our little baby. It's born every year. It has one year of life. We have to understand it as best we can and through that understanding make it better and keep it healthy. Formula One racing is the ultimate chronic condition. You just have to keep working at it. So, there's, there's a lot of stuff that we do in Formula One racing and when we look at other industries we ask ourselves, hmm, can, can other people do that? Is there, is there a way that we can translate that into other applications? Now, healthcare is an interesting one because I think that if you were to ask anyone, are there things that can be done better in healthcare, the answer would be yes. And then it is, well, 
why don't we do something about it? And usually there are thousands of great examples and great reasons not to. And usually the underlying reason is it's, it's hard. It's hard to do something. But in tough times, the only way that you're going to make things happen is to do things. Now we started working with Birmingham Children's Hospital about a year ago and it was, a, it was an interesting, well, it's an interesting hospital in that uh, this is a, uh, a large paediatric hospital in the UK. They have about 30,000 admissions during the year and they're absolutely uh, determined to get the best outcome for all of their babies. But they know that there are still unexplained deaths. There are still life-threatening events that could have been caught. And so several years ago, they decided to, to do something about it. And they introduced a early warning score to be able to determine when deterioration took place on the wards so that you could get the, the, the babies either into intensive care, high dependency, where, wherever was the best place to provide care with the best physician to provide that care. Now there are, they've already had huge improvements through that. They have less cardiac arrests. They have less life-threatening events. But they can still do better. And this is when the Formula One technology came into play. We have a data system that can deal with millions of numbers. So why don't we put it into a hospital and start gathering the data that exists and putting it together into a story that allows us to see when change is starting to happen. So the, uh, what we did was quite simple on a high level. We said, well, let us put a data system into intensive care where we have a very rich seam of data all of the children are already linked up through bedside monitors. We have a high level of expertise. It's one-to-one -one care, so that there are nurses and doctors who are used to looking for things uh, that are happening. And there is a proportionally high number of life-threatening events. And let's extend that. Rather than just connect to all of the beds in the intensive care, Let's connect up to the child transport ambulances that bring those children into intensive care. Why shouldn't we be able to look at the data the moment a child is connected to a bedside instrument on a trolley in an ambulance? It's just telephony. We take it for granted that we can make a phone call, that we can look at Facebook on the internet. Why shouldn't we be able to use that same technology to bring that data immediately so the doctors can start treating the patient as soon as he's collected. The other, the other interesting thing about intensive care is it's remarkably similar in some respects to a Formula One garage. If you cleaned it up a little bit, you could even use it as a Formula One garage. <laughs> the, in intensive care you have this huge amount of data which in many cases is being recorded, sometimes looked at and, it, and then thrown away. Let's grab it, let's learn something from it and in the same way that we use Formula One as our incubation platform to be able to develop innovation, to be able to decide how to do things better. Once you've used that and you've found a way of detecting deterioration by looking at the data that's coming from the, the instruments, then you can say, well, okay, how do I roll this out further? Is there anything that prevents me from going into the wards? Is there anything that prevents me from going into the ambulances? Is there anything that prevents me from discharging a child and monitoring it while it's at home? And the answer is no. The technology is there. This isn't a technology story. The will to do something differently is what you need and as soon as you have that will, then you have a chance to make a difference. Another children's hospital in the UK, Great Ormond Street, had a, a similar epiphany several years ago. A couple of their doctors were watching a Formula One race 
we, we heard earlier that uh, doctors don't work on the weekends. So uh, they, were at, they were watching a Formula One race and they saw a pit stop. And they said to themselves, they're pretty quick changing the wheels of those cars and they seem to do it quite consistently. Do you think there's something we might learn from that? And what they were interested in was how do we deal with the, the handover between cardiac surgery and intensive care? Now, as an engineer, it doesn't sound like a particularly difficult pro problem. You have a child that's been in surgery and you have to move it from one place to another. How hard can that be? Well, obviously it's very difficult because it's a, it's a very complex case. There's a lot of context that needs to be communicated. There is a team of people who have to uh, move that child and keep it safe from harm while it's moving from a very difficult operation into the intensive care unit. So what the doctors at Great Ormond Street said is, let's talk to Formula One. And they, they got Ferrari to, to come to see them and they observed Ferrari pit stops and they had Ferrari observe the handovers. And it's very interesting because a fresh set of eyes comes in and says, why do you do that? Why, why don't those people talk to each other? Why are there people who are, uh, who are changing command of, of how the thing works? And so they set up a new set of procedures and in so doing they've halved the communication errors and the technical errors that were taking place during handover. Now, some of you have seen a Formula One race before, uh, some of you won't. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about pit stops. The pit stop is, on the face of it, a very straightforward task. The car comes in, you change its wheels, the car goes out. What makes it important to it, do it correctly? To make the, the handover of one set of wheels to another is the fact that you may be following a car that is one or two tenths of a second in front of you in the track. And so if you can make your pit stop a few tenths of a second faster than your competitor, you may come out of the pits in front. And that can be the difference between winning and losing. So I'll talk to you a little bit about what a pit stop entails. There are 17 mechanics. During most of the race, they sit quietly in the garage and then about a quarter of a lap before the car is due to come in, they will get the call to go into the pit lane and get ready to change the wheels. I like to think of mechanics a little bit like anaesthetists, in as much that they probably spend 95% of their time just quietly waiting and being calm, and then 5% of their time being in the most stressful area that you could possibly be. Quickly on a pit stop, you have three guys at each wheel. One guy takes the, uh, the wheel nut off. Another guy takes off the wheel. The, next, the third person puts a new wheel on and then they tighten the, the nut. This happens on all four corners. There's a, a fellow at the front with a jack and a fellow at the back. They're the ones who lift the car so you can take the wheels off. There's another guy with a jack in the middle in case you need to change the front nose cone there will be a mechanic who wipes the visor of the, uh, of the driver and another who releases him into traffic in the pit lane. A Formula One pit stop takes less than three and a half seconds. In the Grand Prix in China, there were pit stops that took 3.1 seconds. That's a ridiculous short length of time for doing something. What you have in, in motor racing that you don't have in healthcare is you have one team, so that team can train, practice, practice, practice. You're also able to look at what your competitors do and learn how they make their pit stops faster so that you can fine tune what you're doing. But some of the important lessons transfer directly across. 
Members of the team should know what it is they're meant to do. Members of the team will trust the other members of the team to do their job so they don't need to overlook it, they don't need to, uh, to do it as well. There will be backup, so if something goes wrong, you don't just stop and say, oh, pit stop hasn't worked. You immediately use the backup to get the car out. The other thing that you don't see when you're watching on television is the fact that pit stops are not something which is entirely predictable. Before the race starts, you decide when it is that you expect to bring the car in. But all of the time you have to be watching to see what your competitor does. You also have to be aware and mindful of the, the, the weather, whether it starts raining, whether there's a safety car, if there's a collision out on the track. There are many things that can change and you have to react to that. The Formula One car, as the tyres get worn, the car slows down. As it, the fuel level goes down, it gets lighter the car speeds up. So managing those two things plus all of the traffic around you and all of the unexpected events is what strategy is all about. By looking at the data beforehand, by using simulation, you try to predict as many things as possible so that there are fewer surprises you need to deal with. And I think that there is a, a very strong message there that where, where you have discovered something and if it's at all possible try to embed that knowledge into a system into a, an expert learning system because that frees your intellect to be able to deal with the surprises we shouldn't be spending a lot of time dealing with things which are either predictable or can be dealt with more efficiently by others a few more shots of a pit stop. Again, this is mainly for the benefit of those of you who haven't watched the race. Uh, from the outside, it's quite a mad panic. It is a, a very organised and well orchestrated uh, huddle. They change the wheels, they get ready, the car goes out. While the car is in the, going through the pit stop, the man in charge is the chief mechanic. When the car is out, on the road, the man in charge is the driver. When the strategy is being determined, the man in charge is the, the guy on the pit wall. You don't always have to have one person who is taking the lead in any particular set of circumstances. What you do know, need to do is determine who is the most appropriate person to be dealing with a situation as it unfolds and ensure that that person is empowered and knows that he can take the lead. Formula One cars travel on circuits which are full of twists and turns. They're forever accelerating, going fast, braking, going around the corner, accelerating. It's not, it's not a straightforward path. I've heard it said that fast cars like straights, fast drivers like corners. Fast drivers are the ones that can get around those corners quickly. It's how you de deal with those corners in any walk of life which tests your character and your skill and your determination and sometimes your courage. Now when a racing car is going around the track and the driver touches the steering wheel, the car immediately starts to turn. That's called oversteer. It's very agile, it's almost unstable, but he can control it. On my car, when I turn the steering wheel, I have to give it a bit more of a tug. It's called understeer. It protects me because despite my, uh, my best belief in my self-worth as a driver, I'm not a racing car driver and on some occasions I'm not quite as good as I think I might be. So the car protects me from that. Oversteer scares, cares, oversteer scares passengers. Understeer scares drivers. So, 
When we're travelling around these twists and turns, and there are an awful lot which are presented to doctors and nurses, they have to still travel quickly. There isn't the, the luxury to be able to stop and say, hmm, I'm not quite sure what to do here. Let me sit around and think a while. Illnesses do not wait for, for long consideration. Time is the essence in motor racing. Time is the essence in healthcare. But it's how you deal with those twists and turns that, that make the difference. Now, I'm an engineer. I, I find the, the way that doctors and nurses treat people quite fascinating, quite marvellous, sometimes quite scary. But you should never be scared from doing the right thing because of what the, the non-medical people think. Oversteer scares the passengers. Understeer scares the drivers. You can't be timid about doing the right thing. It's important that you push hard. Safety, reliability and speed. This is the essence of a fast motor, motor car. It's the essence of motor racing. And I believe also it's the essence of healthcare. But a little word of warning here. Whether you're driving a car or whether you're treating a patient, you should always make sure that you don't run out of traction, talent or track all at the same time because hitting a wall can be quite hard. This is Mike Conway, Indy 500, 2010. He hit the, the wall very hard indeed. Happily, uh, he was, well, not unhurt. I was going to say he walked away, but he did have a, a broken leg. But the safety of that car protected him. So in tough times, it's important to recognise what it is that you need to do. In motor racing, our outcomes are very clear. We're there to make a car that takes less time than everyone else to go around the track in a prescribed time or length of race. The result is, if you do that, you win. Many people in healthcare think it's difficult to say, well, what is an important outcome? To me, it's quite simple. If you can reduce the distress of patients and you can stop people from dying when they shouldn't do, that's successful. But it's important in healthcare, as it is in motor racing, to remember it's actually what's in front of you that's most important. Keep looking forward. Thank you very much.